Good evening, and Hello. welcome to the Castro Files. Good, good evening. How are you? Doing great. You? I'm great, thank you. Post Thanksgiving. Yes. Day after. Mm -hmm. Lots of food was had. I hope you guys had a great Thanksgiving. I think I'm still a little full. Absolutely. <laughs> it's good. Leftovers are always the best. But again, always. welcome to the Castro Files. I'm Greg, and you are Beth. Beth. Again. Thank you so much. You can always find us out on all the places where you find podcasts. So iTunes, Spotify, iHeartRadio, mm -hmm. Amazon Music. You can check us out out there if you just want to listen. Or you can watch out on YouTube, of course. So right. with that out of the way, what yes. do you have for us tonight, honey? Uh, I have a story about the Michigan Dog Man. I'm kind of curious about this. Yeah. All right. The Michigan Dog Man. Yeah. Is it a werewolf kind of a thing? We'll see. All right. Yeah. We'll get to it. Yeah. All right. So mine is. Gonna... I would think he classifies as you a think werewolf. So? Yeah. All right. So mine is going to go down a little bit different. It's okay. going to be more of a psychological Ooh. one. And we'll get into it in just a second. But there have been some, you know how like back in the 60s and stuff, people mm -hmm. were doing like weird experiments and stuff like that. And yes. you never know where they true. Do they really document. Are you talking about like the government or well, who's the people? The people. Okay. People in general. Okay. Psychologists or just, just doing some people crazy in different stuff. positions of power this, kind of thing. Yeah. Okay. My story's got a little bit of a could be true, probably not true, hopefully not true. Story. Okay. So you ready to jump into Let's stuff do tonight? This. Yep. Awesome. I'll munch on my chocolate while you read your. There you go. Your Hershey kisses. My, my three Hershey kisses. There we go. So first and foremost, you, do you remember the the Mil Milgram experiment? Nope. And this was basically if you took a psychology uh, psychology class at any point. I took a lot of them. <clears throat> In college or in high school, even they talked about this. This was from like the early '60s, right? Okay. And this is going to lead into our next stories. And this was where you you sat somebody in another room, and there was the control person, the person that was like, basically had to if somebody got it the wrong answer in the other room, doing like taking a test or a quiz, the person in the room in another room had to buzz them, and each time they got buzzed, it slowly increased the pain threshold. Oh, they do that on Ghostbusters. Remember that? Like, yeah. But to the point where, like, and of course they weren't being truly hurt, but it was a psychological, psychological test on the person right. pushing the button. Right? right, not knowing what's coming. Right, to right. the point where they were, like, dreading and, like, but they would sometimes do it. And it was kind of one of those things. This is the psychological kind of test that or idea that one of the, that this story is going to get into. Okay. And I'm going to give you a little bit of background on it. It's okay. called the Russian sleep experiment. Okay. You may or may not have heard of this, but you not. probably have seen at least one picture that's attached to it. And I'll share that here in a couple of minutes. Okay. So the Russian sleep experiment is a creepy pasta uh, story, okay. which tells of, uh, the tale of five test subjects being exposed to an experimental sleep inhibiting stimulant in the Soviet era scientific ex and I'm sorry, sleep inhibiting stimulant in a Soviet era scientific experiment, okay. which has become the basis of an urban legend. Okay. Many news organizations, including Snopes, news.com.au, and Live About, trace the story, story's origins to a website known as Creepypasta. Okay. Being posted on or about August 10th, 2010. Okay. I guess that's pretty specific on or about, mm -hmm. right? Um, by a user named Orange Soda, whose real name is unknown. So I'm not going to get into the story on here, but mm -hmm. I'll get into that because it's, it's creepy. The Russian sleep experiment became immensely popular upon its original publication. It is considered by some to be the greatest and most shared creepypasta story ever. Interesting. And Dread, Je uh, Dread Central's Josh Milliken has called it one of the most shocking and impactful urban legends of the internet age. Interesting. Much of the online and offline debate surrounds the belief held by many that the story is real rather than fiction, and many articles therefore seek to debunk it. This creepypasta is often shared alongside an image of a grotesque demonic figure, which is implied to be one of the test subjects. The image is actually of a life-size animatronic Halloween prop called Spasm. And I'll share that here in a minute as well. Okay. All right. So with that, I just wanted to kind of set the stage. We'll jump into the Russian sleep experiment. Awesome. All right. Let me get a drink real quick. because okay. this, this, this is a juicy one here. <laughs> All right. Oh, where's my note, note and pad pen? Oh, right over there. So 
Russian researchers in the late 1940s kept five people awake for 15 days using an experimental gas-based stimulant. They were kept in a sealed environment to carefully monitor their oxygen intake so the gas didn't kill them. Since it was since it was a in toxic, it was high, it was toxic in high concentrations. This was before closed circuit cameras, so they had only microphones and five inch thick glass porthole sized windows into the chamber to monitor them. The chamber was stocked with books, cots and to sleep on, but no bedding, running water, and toilet and enough dried food to last five or last the five over a month. Oh, wow. And here is the initial five, just to give you, you can see them all there. This is the, the picture that associated with when you okay. look up the Russian sleep study, this is the picture that's associated with it. Okay. And I'll post these out on, on the Instagram as well. Okay. So, the test subjects were political prisoners deemed enemies of the state during World War II. Everything was fine for the first five days. The subjects hardly complained, having been promised falsely that they would be freed if they submitted to the test and did not sleep for 30 days. Their conversations and activities were monitored, and it was noted that they continued to talk about increasingly traumatic incidents in their past. And the general tone of their conversations took on a darker aspect after the, after the four-day mark. After five days, they started to complain about the circumstances and even in events that led them to where they were and started to demonstrate severe paranoia. They stopped talking to each other and began alternately whispering to the microphone and one way in and one way mirrored portholes. Oddly, they all seemed to think that they could win the trust of the experimenters by turning over their comrades, the other subjects in captivity with them. At first, the researchers sus suspected this was an effect of the gas itself. After nine days, the first of them started screaming. He ran the length of the chamber, repeatedly yelling at the top of his lungs for three hours straight. He continued attempting to scream, but was only able to produce occasional squeaks. Hmm. The researchers postulated that he had physically torn his vocal cords. The most surprising thing about his, this behavior is how the other captives reacted to it or rather they didn't react to it. They continued whispering to the microphones until the second of the captives started to scream. The two non-screaming captives took the books apart, smeared page after page with their own feces oh, and pasted them, pasted them calmly over the glass portals. The screaming promptly stopped. So did the whispering to the microphones. After three more days passed, the researchers checked the microphones hourly to make sure they were working since they had, they thought it was impossible that no sound could be coming from uh, coming with five people inside the oxygen consumption in the chamber indicated that all five must still be alive. In fact, it was the amount of oxygen five people would consume at a very heavy level of strenuous exercise oh. on the morning of the 14th day. The researchers did something they said they would not do to get a reaction from the captives. They used the intercom inside the chamber, hoping to provoke any response from the captives. They were uh, captives. They were afraid they were either dead or vegetables. They announced, we are opening the chamber to test the microphone, step away from the door, lie flat on the floor, or you will be shot. Compliance will earn you, oh, earn one of you your immediate freedom. To their surprise, they heard a single phrase in a calm voice response. We no longer want to be freed. Debate broke out among the researchers and the military forces funding the research. Unable to provoke any more response during the intercom, using the intercom, it was finally decided to open the chamber at midnight on the 15th day. <clears throat> the chamber was flushed of stimulant gas and filled with fresh air and immediately voices from the microphones began to object. Three different voices began begging as if pleading for the life of loved ones to turn the gas back on. The chamber was opened and soldiers went in, went soldiers sent in to retrieve the test subjects. They began to scream louder than ever. And so did the soldiers when they saw what was inside Four of the five subjects were still alive. Although no one could rightly call the state that any of their them were in life. 
The food rations past day five had not been so much as touched. There were chunks of meat from the dead test subjects, thighs and chest stuffed into the drain in the center of the chamber, blocking the drain and allowing four inches of water to accumulate in the floor. Precisely how much of the water on the floor was actually blood was never determined. Oh, All four surviving, surviving test subjects also had large portions of muscle and skin torn away from their bodies. The destruction of flesh and, and exposed bone on their fingertips indicated that the wounds were inflicted by hand, not with teeth, as the researchers initially thought. Closer examination of the position and angles of the wounds indicated that most of, if not all of it, were self-inflicted. The abdominal organs began to uh, blow the ribcage of all four test subjects had been removed, while the heart, lungs, and diaphragm remained in place. The skin of most of the mo muscle attached to the ribs had been ripped off, exposing the lungs through the rib cage. All of the blood vessels and organs remained intact. They had just been taken out and laid on the floor, fanning out around the eviscerated but still living bodies of the subjects. The digestive tract of all four could be seen to be working, digesting food. It quickly became apparent that they were digesting was their own flesh that they had ripped off and eaten over the course of the days. Most of the soldiers were Russian special operatives at the facility, but still many refused to return to the chamber to remove the test subjects. They continued to scream to be left in the chamber, alternately begged and demanded that the gas be turned back on, lest they all fall asleep. To everyone's surprise, the test subjects put up a fierce fight at, in the process of being removed from the chamber. One of the Russian soldiers died from having his throat ripped out. Oh, Another was gravely injured by having his testicles ripped off and an artery in his leg severely uh, severed by one of the subject's teeth. Another five of the soldiers lost their lives if you, could, if you count ones that committed suicide in the weeks following the incident. In the struggle, one of the four living subjects had his spleen ruptured and he bled out almost immediately. The medical researchers attempted to sedate him, but it proved impossible. He was injected with more than 10 times the human dose of morphine derivative and still fought like a cornered animal, breaking the ribs and arm of one doctor. When the heart, when heart was seen to be when Hart was seen to beat for a full two minutes after he had bled out to the point where there was no, there was more air in his vascular system than blood. Even after it stopped, he continued to scream and flail after another three minutes for another three minutes, struggling to attack anyone in reach. It was just repeating the word more over and over weaker and weaker until he finally fell silent. The surviving three test subjects were heavily restrained and moved to a medical facility. Uh, the two with intact vocal cords continuously begged for the gas, demanding to be kept awake. The most injured of the three was taken to only surgical to the only surgical operating room in the facility. In the process of preparing the subject to have his organs placed back in his body, it was found that he was effectively immune to the sedative they had to give him to prepare him for the surgery. He fought furiously against his restraints when the anesthetic gas was brought out to, be, to put him under. He managed to tear most of the way through a four-inch wide leather strap on one wrist, even though the weight of the 200-pound soldier holding that wrist as well. It took only a little more anesthetic than normal to put him under, and the instant his eyelids fluttered and closed, his heart stopped. In the autopsy of the test subject, that died on the operating table, it was found that his blood had tripled the normal level of oxygen. His muscles that were still in t attached to his skeleton were badly torn, and he had nine broken bones in his, in his struggle not to not be subdued. Most of them were from the force of his own muscles had exerted on them. So he broke his own arm Crazy. or his own legs. Yeah. The second survivor had been the first of the group to of five to start screaming his vocal cords destroyed. He was unable to beg or object to surgery. And he only reacted by shaking his head violently in disapproval. When the anesthetic gas was brought near him, he shook his head. Yes. When someone suggested reluctantly that they try the surgery without anesthetic and did not react to the entire six hour procedure of Jeez. replacing his abdominal abdominal organs and attempting to cover them with what remained of his skin. The surgeon presiding stated repeatedly that it, it should be medically impossible for a patient to still be alive. 
One terrified nurse assisting the surgery stated that she had seen the patient's mouth curl into a smile ever, several times whenever his eyes met hers. When the surgery ended, the subject looked at the surgeon and began to wheeze loudly, attempting to talk while struggling. Assuming this must be something of drastic importance, the surgeon had a pen and pad fetched so that the patient could write his message. It was simply, keep cutting. The other two subjects were given the same surgery, both without anesthetic as well, although they had to be injected with a paralytic for the duration of the operation. The surgeon found it impossible to perform the operation while the patients laughed continuously. Once paralyzed, the subjects could only follow the attending researchers with their eyes. The paralytic cleared their systems in an abnormally short period of time, and they were soon trying to escape their bonds. The moment they could speak, they were again asking for the stimulant gas. The researchers tried asking what they had, how they had injured themselves and why had they injured themselves why they had ripped out their own guts, and why they wanted to be given the gas again. Only one response was given. I must remain awake. All three subjects' restraints were reinforced, and they were placed back into the chamber, awaiting determination as to what should be done with them. The researchers, facing a wrath of their military benefactors for having failed the stated goals of their project, considering youth, considered euthanizing the surviving subjects, the commanding officer, an ex-KGB uh, in XKGB instead of saw, saw potential. They wanted to see what would happen if they put, were put back on gas. The researchers strongly objected, but they were overruled. In preparation for being sealed in the chamber again, the subjects were connected to an EEG monitor and had their restraints padded for long-term confinement. To everyone's surprise, all three stopped struggling the moment it was let slip that they were going back on the gas. It was obvious that this was the point all three were putting up a great struggle to stay awake. One of the subjects could speak was, I'm sorry, one of the subjects that could speak was humming loudly and continuously. The mute subject was straining on his legs against the leather bonds with all his might. First left, then right, then left again for some, something to focus on. The remaining subject was holding his head off his pillow and blinking rapidly. Having been the first to be wired for the EEG, most of the researchers were monitoring his brain waves in surprise. <clears throat> they were normal most of the time, but sometimes flatlined inexplicably. It looked as, as if he were repeatedly suffering brain death before returning to normal. As they focused on, pap on the paper scrolling out of the brainwave monitor, only one nurse saw his eyes shut at the same time the moment his head, at the same time, his, same moment rather, his head hit the pillow. His brain waves immediately changed to that of a deep sleep, then flatlined for the last time as his heart simultaneously stopped. The only remaining subject that could speak started screaming to be sealed in now. His brain waves showed the same flat lines as ones as the one who just died. The commander gave the other the order to seal the chamber with both subjects inside, as well as the three researchers. One of, the, oh, one of the named three immediately drew his gun and shot the commander point blank between the eyes, then turned the gun on the mute subject and blew his brains out as well. He pointed the gun at the remaining subject, still restrained to the bed as the remaining members of the medical and research team fled the room. I won't be locked in here with these things, not, uh, not with you, he screamed at the man strapped to the bed. What are you, he demanded. I must know. The subject smiled. Have you forgotten so easily? The subject asked. We are you. We are the madness that lurks within you all, begging to be free at every moment in your deepest animal mind. We are what you hide in your beds, hide from in your beds every night. We are what you sedate into silence and paralysis when you go into go to the nocturnal haven where we cannot tread. <clears throat> the researcher paused. They aimed at the subject's heart and fired. The EEG flatlined as the subject weakly choked out, so nearly free. It's creepy. Creepy story, right? Creepy, creepy. Yeah. So, so that is I, the the Russian sleep experiment. I feel like it's probably a mix of some truth and some make believe. You never know, right? Mm -hmm. So, more than likely, it's a make believe story, right? Right. And this is the other picture that gets associated with it. Right here. 
Yes. Pretty creepy. You I probably was seen it online. It I, when you were reading, I was looking Did it up you? online. Yeah. Yeah. Somewhere out there. But yeah, it's just a creepy monster because you think, and this is what I remember seeing this story like years ago or hearing it at least. Okay. Somewhere along the line. I might have read it or heard something about it, but it's been a while and I was like, oh man. But those sleep studies, like you think back in the 60s, kind of going to the point of going beyond just trying what was different probably. Things. Um, allowed even yeah well, just ethical. Name for ethical thank yeah, you absolutely yeah. beyond what's ethical right? yeah i mean you think just what was we've talked about just the medical mm-hmm. practices and procedures that were done to people in the trying to help them right right even though it seems insane at yeah. this point right so totally. hope you like that story i always good. get a I kick. liked it it's a creepy one for sure so it was a good one All good right. story good story what's your story so my story is called The Dogman. Dog it is still man. from that Urban Legends, Ghost Stories and Folklore book that I'm reading. Yeah. Um, so um, let's see. So it starts off. So the, it, it gives you a little, you don't know if it's real or not, but the film is grainy. It flickers and flashes. The camera is unstable throughout the entirety of the home video. It is blurred and there's no sound. There are glimpses of a father cutting wood and taking a much deserved respite for a sip of water. The man is Aaron Gable, and this three-minute film seems to be some sort of found footage montage of a family vacation or simply a family, uh, family's home movie. Two boys are seen riding snowmobiles. These are Aaron's sons. The film often cuts to the wide expanse of snow-covered Michigan wilderness and sprinkles in clips of the boys and the family dog here and there. There is a scene where we see Aaron Gable working under the hood of a beat up old Ford pickup and then speaking to the camera holder. We assume that in this case, he was speaking to one of his sons because we quickly we quickly catch a glimpse of the boy in the passenger seat mirror as he films the family driving down a wind uh, winding back road. The camera strafes to the right to the left and back again as the young gable boy captures the dead and fallen trees of the michigan winter woods all seems in order until the two minute 45 second mark at which point we see just for a brief second what appears to be some sort of quad pedal creature in the woods the five i'm sorry the film then cuts to who we can assume to be mr gable carrying the camera through the woods obviously intent on seeking out this creature that his son had caught in the last frame there's some intense moments here of walking and then running through the trees it is very eerie almost disturbing as again there's no sound and the camera work seems to become more and more frantic as it continues to capture what is happening we catch a glimpse here and there of what might be a creature but are never really sure We are left wondering through the next 15 to 20 seconds, then at the three minute and nine mark, we are given a first solid look at the beast. Though the conditions of the recording leave much to be desired, one thing stands out in crystal clear quality. It is massive. The size and the shape of the creature is jarring. It looks like, and if this wasn't in the middle of Michigan, I'd swear it was a silverback gorilla. Trying to imagine a great silverback gorilla with a body more akin to a grizzly and a head of a wolf. Even though all grain and fuzz of the home video, you can still see its muscles stretch under the bounder-like form of its body. I'm sorry, boulder-like form of its body. We're only given a few seconds to take this all in as it immediately begins to charge Mr. Gable. Its speed and ferocity are nothing short of awe-inspiring. In an incredible, frightening sort of way, (laughs) there's a blur of ground, then sky, then trees as Mr. Gable runs for his life. The last frame of the film is a giant, hungry maw opened wide and ravenous. Ma, M-A-W. A maw? Yeah. (laughs) That's probably another word for... Oh, wrong thing. Hold on. I'll tell you. Like, what's a maw? You know those fancy words. A jar throat of a ferocious animal. Okay. Open wide and ravenous. Spittle flying everywhere as it chomps down on the camera. We are left staring at a blank black screen. Uh, The legend. In the late 1800, Michigan was the leader in the white pine production. So it only fitting that our Michigan dogman was discovered by a group of lumberjacks. It is said that these men were high in the mountains and deep in the Michigan forest when they came across a strange looking dog. It was still quiet. It was still quite a ways away, but it caught their attention and they honestly probably needed the distraction as the area that they were in was quite remote and there really was nothing to occupy their time but sleep and work. And so a chastened shirt. 
They describe the dog initially as being large, but oddly proportioned, having an extended and very muscular body, much like a track athlete. The, re- the men reported that it seemed very, very frightened, which is why they gave chase. They cornered the dog in a small corpse of fallen trees. It had nowhere to go, so it hid inside a large, hollowed-out log. They proceeded to poke at it with their axes, trying to coax it out. Do you really want to do that? That's why I gave you the look like, oh, why would you mess with this creature? So the dog was yelping and crying, and even this did not deter the lumberjacks from their game. But the yelps and cries became less and less frightened, pained thing, and a more angry and ferocious thing. Before the men could reconsider their course of action or abandon it altogether, they were blown back by a force so powerful that it lifted them from the ground. Shards and splinters flew as a giant seven-foot-tall bipedal beast burst forth. Its teeth were like spears. Its roaring was the thing of nightmares. Its eyes were icy and cold, crystal blue and piercing. It reached out and grabbed one of the woodman's axe and snapped it in two. The head of the axe dropped to the ground with a muffled thud. The handle, fractured and, uh, fractured and fragmented, still in its claws, um, a vice grip of fury and rage. The men fled for their lives, abandoning their post and their possessions as their flight took them down the mountain as far away from the creature as they could get. The re- they reported their experience to the authorities, and soon enough, an investigation was in full swing. Lumberjacks, the authorities, and curious civilians all combed through the wood mountain, wooded mountains looking for the beast, or at least a sign that would point to such a monster. They found small corp. They they found the small corpse was a, a, a area of dead trees. Okay. They found the exploded log and the splintered axe. They found large canine like prints in some groups of four and in some groups of two, but they did not find the creature. The creature would not be seen for another ten years. But the rumors and gossip and stories of the legend of the Michigan Dogman would certainly triumphant its return or trumpet its return. Um, let's see. I skipped some of this. Hold on. Sounded kind of like you wanted to be left alone. He initially. did want to be. And he was I, just trying to hide. Yeah. Right? And yeah. Then they and they're lucky poke. that he didn't eat them. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. So we we'll to talk a little bit. So it is said that the dogman only appears every 10 years. And this seems to be backed up by witnesses accounts that more often than not seem to be reported within that cycle. In 1887 was the first reported sighting, but certainly not the first sighting ever. It seems that every 10 years, there are multiple sightings of the dogman, or should I say dogmen, from all across the U.S. There are hundreds of recorded encounters alluding to or outright claiming to have seen or had some kind of exchange with the beast. One of the most chillings was that of a a fisherman by the name of Reynolds. Reynolds was fly fishing in the Manistee River, also known as the Big Manistee in North Michigan. In the report, he stated that he had been there all day and was getting frustrated because he had usually caught all that he would car- could carry by then, but for some reason, the fish just weren't biting that day. He knew it was probably had something to do with Homer, his young black lab that he had brought with him for the first time. He had thought better of it and almost left him at home, but the look in his big brown dumb puppy dog eyes got the better of him. Yes, Homer was running around, barking and darting in and out of the trees and chasing squirrels, but he wasn't getting near the water. Reynolds made a note that this was something that he would have to train out of him eventually, but today was not the day. Homer was leaving the river and the fish alone, but that wasn't it. He couldn't put a finger on it, but it was abnormally silent, strangely still. It had been all day, I'm sorry, it had been all day outside of the random squirrel or rabbit rabbit that Homer stirred up. There was nothing, no movement, no sound, just Homer. And then eventually that stopped. No more barking, no more running, no more Homer. Oh, shit. Reynolds tried not to let his imagination run wild. He set his rod down as calmly as he could and started scanning the tree lines and calling the dog's name. Homer, come here, boy. Nothing. Then there was a shadow in the tree line. Then the... There in the shadows of the tree line stood a dark dog or wolf-like creature. It was massive. It reports states that it was standing on two legs, approximately seven to eight feet tall, and staring directly at Reynolds. Reynolds sucked in an audible gasp, but could do little else. He was frozen in fear. From head to toe, the creature was covered in dark gray, almost sable fur. Its ears were sharp, pointing straight up. Little tufts of light-colored hair or fur glistened in the setting sun for the points. Reynolds stated that it was that its mountainous shoulders rose and fell slowly with each deep synchronous breath uh, draw of breath. 
Its muscular form promised defeat, and Reynolds knew he would not be able to beat it or outrun it. He just had to wait. Waiting was difficult because the creature's in the creature's right hand was a small, broken body of Homer. Oh no! His black fur slick with blood. There was almost enough to make Reynolds. That was almost enough to make Reynolds move. But then the creature did something that haunted Reynolds to the day he died. He smiled at him. Reynolds is quoted as saying, I know you won't believe me. I still don't know if I believe me, but the damn thing was trying to smile. It locked eyes with me and wouldn't let me look away. Its eyes were the bluest, coldest eyes I'd ever seen, and it smiled. It just smiled and walked away. Apparently, the dog man just let Reynolds go. It took poor Homer with it and just walked away, disappearing in the forest. Reynolds never saw it again. It's a crazy story, right? Mm -hmm. That's why you bring a rifle in the woods. In 1987, a disc jockey named Steve Cook thought it would be fun to put a few of these stories together in a song and play it on the air. So he, accompanied by a keyboard player, uh, a keyboard played by his producer, Bob Farley, released this five-minute, super minimalistic tune retelling of some of the earlier tales of the dogmen. They expected that to be that. they, They expected that to be that. They'd play it once, and it's kind of a joke or homage, and be done. But that was not the case. The phone, the radio's phones lit up with people from all over, not requ- not only requesting to hear the song again and asking where they could purchase it, but with people wanting to tell their own stories, their own personal encounters with the dogmen. They, of course, became an overnight sensation, sensation and the song was requested over and over. Um, so much so that they would make copies, but they could never, and they were going to sell them for three dollars. Mm-hmm. But they could never seem to keep enough in stock. Like they're always having to replenish it. I'll, I'm not going to sing it, obviously. And I we have a I, copy. Of I it. have a copy yeah. of it that we can put on yeah. the Instagram um, stuff. But it's I'll read it. It says, "A cool summer morning in early June is when the legend began at a nameless logging camp in Wexford County, where the Manistees River runs." Eleven lumberjacks near the Garland Swamp found an animal they thought was a dog. In a playful mood, they chased it around till it ran inside a log. A logger named Johnson grabbed him a stick and poked around inside. Then the thing let out an earth- earthly scream and came out and stood upright. None of those men ever said much about whatever happened then. They just packed up their belongings and left that night and were never heard from again. It was 10 years later in 1990, uh, in 97 when a farmer near Buckley was found slumped over his plow. His heart had stopped. There were dog tracks all around. They think he got scared of that. Mm-hmm. Seven years past mm-hmm. the turn of the century, they say a crazy old widow, widow had a dream that of dogs that encircled her house that night. They walked like men and screamed. In 1917, a sheriff who was out walking found a driverless wagon and tracks in dust where the wolves had been stalking. Near the roadside, a four-horse team lay dead with their eyes wide open. When the vet finished up his investigation, he said it looked like they had been they had died of fright. In 57, a man of the cloth found marks on an old church door. The newspaper said they had been made by a dog, but he had to but he, that dog had to have stood at 7 foot 4. In 67, a van load of hippies told a park ranger named Quinlan they'd been awakened in the night by a scratching at the window, and there was a dog man looking in and grinning. (laughs) In the summer of 87, near Luther, it happened again at a cabin in the woods. It looked like maybe someone had tried to break in. There were cuts around the door that could only have been made by very sharp teeth and claws. He didn't have shoes because the fe- he didn't have feet. He walked on just two paws. And somewhere in the north with darkness, a creature walks upright. And the best advice you may ever get is don't go out at night. Um, so um, he goes on to say, we know that the story of the Michigan dog man and its legacy, but where did it come from? Sadly, we may never know. We know that it is out there. We know from the multitude of eyewitnesses that it is a very large and intimidating, that it's athletic and strong. There are numerous reports of the dogman jumping over and across two and even four lanes of traffic in a single leap. There are eyewitness accounts of the beast killing livestock and family pets, but never once killing a human, at least on purpose. There are those reported uh, found dead from apparent heart attacks Mm -hmm. or simply dying of fear, but never killed. We don't know what we don't know is what is it? Where did it come from? And why every 10 years? It's a werewolf. Yeah. Well, it, 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 I think it's a werewolf. I, there's some pictures if you want to share. Absolutely. So we've got the dog man photo. So this is the legend of the dog man. Yeah. There's a ton. Absolutely. You can go out, you can go out. There's a ton of, well, there's a ton of books too that people have written over the years about this, this creature. Um, but this is a rendering that somebody did. Okay, 
you go. Yeah, that's a rendering of what somebody did that that they think he looked like. Yeah, they so, of, I mean, of people telling. There's a him. whole bunch. I have one that I just randomly just typed in just to get something for yeah. a, for a slide also, and yeah, I never knew the, the, the thing of like the. I never heard about him either. The so. lore. It's kind of like the you know the Bigfoot yep. that we went over, right? Yep. Um, there things are out there, and here's another one you sent me that appears to have it out kind of walking like somebody in. caught it on a picture yeah let me blow this up a little yeah bit. so there's a circle a red circle yeah that and i'll post is, these out as is well supposedly supposed to be a capture picture of the dog man i don't know so he is out there um it's a great story Michigan dog man yeah it's it's a great the song story. is great when you hear it with yeah the it's super folklore it. and yeah. um he's just reading he's not singing but it's to music and yeah there, uh, I don't know if that's the He's original got one. Kind of like a yeah, twang. country boy twang yeah. to him. Um, I I don't know if that's the original one because they have made some remakes of it with it has a little bit more instrumental stuff in it. Yeah. So, um, but it's it's fun. It's cool. Yeah, yeah great and it's story. It's funny that it like was actually played on the radio, right? And people wanted to hear it again and again and, then and they again. They started calling in with their the stories, own stories of things that had so, happened to them. So yeah, the Michigan dog man. Yeah, great story. Thank story. you very much. Of course, I it's hope awesome. you enjoyed it. I yeah, hope you guys absolutely. liked it. Thank you all. Absolutely. Be posting. So our shows go up Sunday nights at 8 p.m. Central. So you can go back. You can look at some of the or watch some of the older ones out there. We've just started episode 13 today. Wow, already. So 13 weeks of fun. Absolutely. There you so go. with that, thank you so much. Go like and subscribe to the Castro Files channel on YouTube. Check out the Instagram channel. That's where we post all of the videos or all of the pictures rather yep. for this. So with that, Thank you so Bye much. Guys. Have a great, Have a great week. Bye.